Well, welcome to my attic place. Sometimes I have visitors, in this case. I'm pleased to introduce you to Senator Marlowe Cook. We're going to share a little bit of history with you. Something he's real good at. Uh, concerning that eventful day, April 14th, 1865. I wandered to the village town. I've sat beneath the tree. Upon the schoolhouse playing ground that sheltered you and me. But none were there to greet me, Tom, and none were there to know that played with us upon the grass just twenty years ago. April the 14th. 1865, a spring day in Washington, D.C., cherry blossoms all in bloom. An uneventful day saw General Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, and his wife leaving the city late in the afternoon for New York City to visit Mrs. Grant's sister. They had been requested to join the President and Mrs. Lincoln for a play, The American Cousin. And because Mrs. Grant did not enjoy being in the company of Mrs. Lincoln, she decided to visit her sister in New York. The train carrying General Grant abruptly stops late in the evening. Somewhere between Baltimore and Wilmington, Delaware, General Grant rushes off the train going north to a private train coming south. Problems in Washington. At approximately 8.30 p.m., President and Mrs. Lincoln, accompanied by Clara Harris and Major Henry Rathbone, entered Ford's Theater for the performance of Our American Cousin, featuring Laura Keene. It is estimated that John Wilkes Booth fired the shot at 13 minutes past 10 p.m. Lincoln was taken to a house across the street owned by one William Peterson at 453 10th Street Northwest and on April the 15th, 1865 in the morning, the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, stopped breathing at 721 and 55 seconds. His pulse ceased to beat at 722 and 10 seconds. It's believed that both the President and General Grant were to be assassinated on the same evening. It earlier assumed that Grant would accompany the President to the theater. Grant's wife chose to leave the city for a visit to her sister, and Grant asked to be excused. The Grants caught a train from Union Station, and sometime later, Grant received a letter from the assassin who said that he could not gain entry to the car because the conductor had locked the doors at each end, that he was thankful for that because then he could not fulfill his mission. Grant was advised on the train by the way of the shooting and caught a special train back to Washington. He felt a sense of dereliction of duty for a long time for his failure to have been with his commander in chief at Forn's Theater. This boat pilot, storekeeper, postmaster, surveyor, lawyer, politician, congressman, president, this man from New Salem and Springfield, Illinois, Spencer County, Indiana, and Hardin County, Kentucky, was born on February the 12th, 1809. He was mortally wounded April the 14th, 1865, at the age of 56 years. Well, old Abel Lincoln came out of the wilderness, out of the wilderness, out of the wilderness. Well, old Abel Lincoln came out of the wilderness down in Illinois. In your walks around the capital of the United States, you will find illuminated above the gallery door 
in the House of Representatives the words of Webster, imploring those who convene here to see whether we also in our day and generation may not perform something worthy to be remembered. And my oh my, how Abraham Lincoln fulfilled that admonition. Old Jeff Davis now he tore down the government, he tore down the government, he tore down the government. Old Jeff Davis now he tore down the government, down in secession land. But old Abe Lincoln now he'll build up a better one, he build up a better one, he build up a better one. Old Abe Lincoln, yes he build up a better one down in a Washington. Basically, there are five main individuals in, Amer in American history involved in this saga. Laura Keene, Edwin M. Stanton, John Wilkes Booth, Abraham Lincoln, and Andrew Johnson. Now, Laura Keene. Beautiful dreamer, wake unto me. Starlight and dew drops are waiting for thee. Sounds of the rude world heard in the day, lulled by the moonlight, have all passed away. Laura Keene is indeed the star of this play, and to the extent she was about to play her last role in Our American Cousin on the night of the 15th, she was overjoyed. She hated the role in that play and looked forward to taking the night train to Cincinnati, Ohio to begin anew her love of Shakespeare as a true dramatic actress. She was, in fact, the best person, period, of the American stage in the late 19th century. The fame of our American cousin became so great all over America, Canada, and even in Australia that unfortunately for her, she spent most of her stage life producing and playing in that play, longing to regain her life in the romance of theater of Shakespeare. She died in the United States in 1873. John Wilkes Booth. Wilkes Booth came to Washington, an actor great was he. He played at Ford's Theater, and Lincoln went to see. It was early in April, not many weeks ago. The people of that fair city all gathered at the show. The war, it was all over, the people happy now. And Abraham Lincoln arose to take his bow. Booth, son of the famous actor Junius Brutus Booth, America's foremost tragedian of the period, played and wrote works of a tragic mode. His sons, John and Edwin, were both actors. John made his stage debut in Baltimore in 1855 and was very successful. Unlike the rest of his family, John was dedicated to the South and the institution of slavery. He originally created a plot to kidnap Lincoln, take him into the South, thus calling on the government to surrender or lose its commander-in-chief. Nothing came of that plan, so his actions on the night of April the 14th. Jay Wilkes Booth comes down the aisle he had measured once before. He passes Lincoln's bodyguard and nodding at the door. He holds a dagger in his right hand and a pistol in his left. He shoots poor Lincoln in the temple and sends his soul to rest. As Booth jumped from the box, he caught his leg in the, and, and part of the bunting on the box. 
breaking his left leg. As he hit the stage, brandishing his dagger, he yelled, Sick Semper Tyrannus, the motto of the Commonwealth of Virginia, meaning thus also to tyrants, or this it will ever be for tyrants. He'll rue the day, he'll rue the hour, as God him life shall give. When Booth stood in the center of the stage, crying tyrants shall not live. Knowing the play by heart, he shot just as the crowd laughed at a line during the performance. Lincoln was taken to the Peterson house across the street from Ford's Theater. Booth found his way to the home of Dr. Samuel Mudd, who set his leg gave him a pair of crutches, and Booth was on his way. Dr. Mudd was sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor. While contending, he did not recognize Booth, and as a doctor, had set the man's leg. Booth finally got across the river on the night of April the 21st, and wound up in a tobacco barn on the Garrett's farm in Caroline County, Virginia, with David Harold, an accomplice, who surrendered his troops set fire to the barn. Men called out for Booth to surrender. Staying in the barn, he was fired upon, removed to the the porch of the farmhouse, and died two hours later proclaiming, I did what I thought was best. By the way, you now know the origination of the phrase, your name is Mud. Poor Lincoln then was heard to say when all had gone to rest Of all the actors in this town I loved Wilkes Booth the best Edwin McMaster Stanton Born Steubenville, Ohio, 1814 Died in Washington, 1869 And Andrew Johnson, Vice President and President of the United States, born Raleigh, North Carolina, 1808, and died in Carter Station, Tennessee in 1875. First, Stanton was tough, uncompromising, arrogant, pompous, and one hard-nosed lawyer. He grew up as a Democrat, and when he got to Washington to practice law, he became an extremely anti-slavery individual. Thus, he was chosen as Assistant Secretary of War under Simon Cameron for legal affairs. Within a year, Cameron was run out of office, and Lincoln asked Staunton to become his Secretary of War. Staunton's real goal in the political arena was to someday to become a member of the Supreme Court of the United States. When Lincoln was shot, Stanton took over Washington to the extent of denying the right of habeas corpus, declared martial law, and took every aspect of the investigation of the brutal murder unto himself. He, in effect, put the entire cast of the American cousin under house arrest in Ford's theater. He despised the South. As the result of his attitude, things started to happen. Andrew Johnson was sworn in immediately after Lincoln was declared dead at 7.22 a.m. April the 15th. It was Staunton in the room at the time and not known for his poetry who whispered, now he belongs to the ages. All our land is draped in mourning, hearts are bowed and strong men weep. For our loved, our noble leader, sleeps his last, his dreamless sleep. Gone forever, gone forever, fallen by a traitor's hand. Though preserved his dearest treasure, our redeemed, beloved land. Farewell, Father, friend, and guardian. Thou hast joined the martyr band, but thy glorious work remaineth 
our redeemed beloved land. President Johnson started a program to solidify the North and the South to end all the strife and through his power of pardon proposed one for Jefferson Davis, formerly President of the Confederacy. This infuriated Stanton. Stanton proceeded to build a fire to impeach Andrew Johnson for his actions to covet the enemy, to end the negotiations to restore the country. Johnson fired Stanton, who refused to leave and barricaded himself in his office. In February 1868, articles of impeachment were brought against President Johnson by the House of Representatives. The matter was set for trial in the United States Senate. The trial was held during which time Staunton refused to leave the office. Ultimately, Johnson survived his trial in the Senate by one vote. Staunton giving up and gave up and removed himself from office and returned to the private practice of law. As a caveat, having been a colleague of the new president, Ulysses S. Grant, who succeeded Johnson, Stanton prevailed on Grant to appoint him to the Supreme Court of the United States. So on December the 20th, 1869, Grant appointed Stanton to the court. He was appointed and confirmed on the same day. His long desired wish had been granted. On December the 24th, Christmas Eve, he left his residence to walk to the court. He had a heart attack and died on the sidewalks of Washington, D.C. four days after his elevation to the Supreme Court. Thus, we come to the end of this tragedy, 12 weeks after the killing. By order of Stanton's military court, Harold, along with two men and one woman, whom apparently participated in the plot, named Payne, Atzelrott, and Mary Surratt, were hanged by the neck until dead. Dr. Mudd got life at hard labor. Two others, O'Laughlin and Arnold, also got life, and one, Edwin Spangler, got six years. The military court cared little, cared little about evidence, and many who had examined all of the documents are convinced the trial was unauthorized and the deaths were pure and simple murder. <laughs> Some now within the churchyard lie, some sleep beneath the sea. There's little left of our old class excepting you and me. And when our time shall come, dear town, and we are called to go, I hope they'll lay us where we played just twenty years ago. Lincoln, God rest his soul, had a terrible time getting settled beneath the earth. Grave snatchers were determined to steal his casket. And believe it or not, it was not until 36 years after his death that his final burial place was determined by his son Robert. True they tell us wreaths of glory Evermore will deck his brow But the soon the anguish only sweeping o'er our heartstrings now. Sleep today, O oh early fallen, in thy green and narrow bed. Dirges from the pine and cypress mingle with the tears we've shed. We shall meet, but we shall miss him. There will be one vacant chair We shall linger to caress him While we breathe our evening prayer We will linger to caress him While we breathe our evening prayer 
Could we as people have done more to prevent our going to war with each other? Was it inevitable that it was going to happen? Lincoln had said we could not exist half free and half slave. Who fired first and if it made any difference, who really cared? It was going to happen. What would our country have been like if the South had won? As to the assassination of Lincoln, who felt he fought this war so such prejudice would disappear, I would give you the words of Reinhold Niebuhr. A minister born in Wright City, Missouri, taught Christian ethics at the Union Theological Seminary in New York, who said, and listen carefully to this, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. If the South had won the Civil War, had Lee won at Gettysburg, England would have recognized the Confederacy and France would have stayed in Mexico with a French empire from Panama to the Rio Grande River. The Northwest would have seceded from the Northeast and taken over 5440. Russia would have kept Alaska in all probability, having taken all Northwest Canada. There would have been the Northwest Republic, the Northeast Republic, the Confederate Republic, the Mexican Empire in the Southwest, with California, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico of, as a very integral part of that empire. And the Bolsheviks would have had the whole Northwest, and then what? Maybe the Northeast and the Southeast could have created an alliance and held the Russians at the Mississippi River, isn't that great to contemplate? My sympathies and all my family were on the side of the South, but I think the organization of the greatest republic in the history of the world was worth all the sacrifices made to save it. Signed, Harry S. Truman, Independence, Missouri. Oh, I wish I was in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away, Dixieland. Well, I wish I was in Dixie. Away. Dixieland, I'll take my stand to live and die in Dixieland. Cause Dixieland, now that's where I was born in. Early Lord, one frosty morning. Look away, look away, look away.
an interesting caveat to the life sentence of Dr. Sam Mudd. A lone rider rode up to the farmhouse of Mrs. Mudd in Maryland on the 5th day of February, 1869. The rider delivered a note to Mrs. Mudd from the President of the United States, which read, Dear Mrs. Mudd, as promised, I have drawn up a pardon for your husband, Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. Please come by my office at your earliest convenience. I wish to sign it in your presence and give it to you personally. Sincerely, Andrew Johnson, President of the United States of America. Many pleas over the years have not moved the Army to strike that case from the records of the military courts. Thus the history of a play and the ramifications of history as the result of the actions of one man determined to destroy a man in consequence a myth and world acclaim to a president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. Stanton's remark was truly correct. He now belongs to the ages. Ooh, thus be it ever where free men shall stand between their loved homes and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heavens rescued land praise the power that hath made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just, and thus be our motto in God is our trust. Then the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free. And the home of the sharing with us some of this history. I hope we'll be hearing from him again. Thank you.